Welcome to Stan the Energy Man. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies, State of Hawaii, under the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. And uh, we're glad to have you here today. We're, we've got a special guest uh, coming to us all the way from the mainland, because as we all know, people in Hawaii don't know anything about hydrogen, so we bring in experts from around the world. So this guy's not only from California, he's actually from further around the world and works for a company in the UK called ITM uh, Power, and they do um, some pretty innovative things with hydrogen, which is the all know is my favorite subject. So we've got uh, Mr. Steve Jones from ITM, Skyping in from uh, over there in Cali uh, Irvine, Irvine, California. Is that where you're at, Steve? Uh, Anaheim. Anaheim. I was close. So yeah, all, Cal yeah. all California. But uh, thanks for being here. The only time I ever see you is when it, we're meeting at a, we meet at a conference or something. So <laughs> good, good to see you uh, up on, on the screen there. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, what got you interested in uh, the, the line of work you're in and what got you working with uh, ITM and uh, the kind of things that you do over there in Anaheim. Sure, yeah. So uh, a bit of background on, on myself. I'm a materials scientist by trade um, and way back years ago when I was still uh, studying at university in, in Birmingham in the UK. Uh, Birmingham University have uh, a hydrogen program and uh, part of my uh, post um, uh, degree work was done in the field of actually uh, hydrogen separation membranes. So membranes that filter out all of the um, impurities in a hydrogen stream and provide pure hydrogen for semiconductors or fuel cells or whatever. So that was kind of how I got involved in, in the hydrogen industry. Um, and then um, almost by chance, uh, by good timing, uh, ITM Power was um, uh, floating on the London uh, Stock Exchange, uh, you know, a few years after I graduated. And, um, you know, I saw the advert and, and here we are almost 12 years later. Um, and I've transition through from being um, on the development team, you know, doing some of the hands-on work in the labs and, and developing prototypes and things like that, up through into the the managerial and business development roles. Um, and then going back about three years, I did a bunch of business development here in California from the UK. So I was doing a lot of, uh, of, of flight times, uh, hopping across the, uh, across the pond. And then we got to a stage where we had enough traction uh, that it made sense for me to be here permanently. So for the last two years, um, I've been here uh, with my family in Anaheim um, doing the, uh, the work for ITM Power Inc., which is the, the um, subsidiary of ITM Power PLC that's based out here. Um, and really what we're trying to do is develop uh, hydrogen technology in, in two two kind of uh, tracks, which often overlap, uh, as you know, you have uh, clean fuel. So we're making um, renewable hydrogen uh, fueling stations for fuel cell vehicles. Um, we're doing that in the UK, in France, and here in the US, based around our um, innovative uh, PEM electrolyzer technology. Um, and we're also doing energy storage work, which again is using the same core and electrolyzer technology, um, but using it to store excess renewable energy at times when there's more energy than demand, um, storing that as hydrogen, and then using that hydrogen for various things. It could be used for re-electrification later on, um, could be used for vehicle fuel, could be used as a chemical feedstock, um, and can even be used um, as a straight replacement for fossil fuel uh, natural gas uh, like we're doing in Germany, where we're actually injecting hydrogen directly into the pipeline system in Germany, and we're substituting um, uh, natural gas for hydrogen. Wow. It sounds like you're pretty busy, and and it's really kind of exciting for us because we, we actually have a small natural gas grid here in Honolulu uh, with Hawaii Gas Company, and they're a publicly regulated utility. So we'd really like to see them kind of mirror some of the things you're doing especially the things that they're doing to support the transportation industry. Um, so I know in California, um, that's a big, a big push that ITM's on in California is building the stations. Um, how many stations do you guys plan to uh, participate in over there? And, and are they primarily um, 
production on site or are they you know taking uh, gas from a, a grid like you like the gas grid or between one of the big uh, gas manufacturers you know off of one of their pipelines or what's the, the concept over there in California sure yeah so um, the state of California has a big uh, incentive on hydrogen infrastructure and um, the, the state has earmarked two hundred million dollars uh, over a ten year period to finance um, building hydrogen fueling stations um, so that the vehicle companies have confidence to roll out hydrogen fuel cell vehicles amongst the general public safe in the knowledge that the public can go and get fuel and it's reliable and, and they're not going to get stranded. So they do this via an annual uh, competition uh, solicitation process uh, and ITM has participated in the previous two years um, competitions and we received awards in, in each of those years for one, one station the first year, one station the second year. Uh, and then the third year's uh, competition has actually just uh, closed and people have just submitted their bids. And the California Energy Commission are busy um, figuring out the winners and losers from that competition. We should find out in the next month or so. Um, and ITM have, have stepped it up a little this year and that we've, we've put five applications in this year. Um, as opposed to the one in the previous two years. So we're looking to keep our toe in the water um, uh, in California on the station front. All of our stations are centered around on-site uh, renewable hydrogen generation. So all the hydrogen is made on site so that we're not relying on hydrogen being delivered to the sites. But I think longer term, uh, my vision of, of ITM uh, longer term in California is as we get more and more stations, and the demand for hydrogen grows and the demand for renewable hydrogen grows, um, that ITM will become more of a fuel provider rather than a station owner and operator. And we'll have larger centralized hydrogen production facilities that are you know, up into the megawatt sizes producing hundreds, thousands of kilograms of hydrogen a day that are then distributed to the network of stations in California. And doesn't California have a mandate of like 30% clean hydrogen yeah. versus steam reformed hydrogen? That's right. So the state law is that um, uh, a third, 33% of hydrogen that is delivered to fuel cell vehicles needs to be renewable. So that means that it either comes from steam reformation of biogas um, or electrolysis using renewable uh, electricity. So those are the two options really that, that are used. And um, that 33% is, is the law at the moment. And uh, California are very keen on pushing that boundary higher than 33% or all the way up to 100%. Um, and you know we're looking at using electrolysis to manage um, the excess renewable electricity, which takes place in the middle of the day when the big solar um, um, you know, the, the, the big um, industrial arrays, you know, the big yeah, there's a lot of solar in California, and we get this huge peak in the middle of the day, and um, sometimes it outweighs the demand for energy. And so, the idea is to use that excess, make hydrogen, and use hydrogen in the transportation industry uh, because the state, uh, as you know, has, um, has a mandate to reduce the CO2 output from its transportation sector uh, in the future. Right. So, you know, a lot of times I get asked about the round trip efficiency of hydrogen when you're doing electrolysis. And it, it, they, they say it doesn't really pencil out all that well. I mean, if you're getting free or really cheap curtailed power, you might be able to make it work. It, what's on the horizon to kind of bring that business case a little bit tighter? I know a big company like ITM has got to be looking at that for the long term. What are some of the implications there for uh, getting the the round term round trip efficiency and the and the cost you know to where it's feasible to use more electrolysis. Sure. Yeah, it's a good question. So the um, the round trip efficiency really is is a question of uh, the the efficiency of the actual electrolyzer itself. So turning electrons into hydrogen, um, and that's already a relatively efficient process, about seventy five percent efficiency. And we're constantly, through our R&D center in the UK, constantly pushing that boundary higher and higher. We have um, our, our highest plant to date out in the field, uh, which is utilizing some of the waste heat that the electrolyzer produces, uh, is operating around 86% efficient, and that's with uh, RWE in Germany. Um, but I think the, 
one of the other questions is you're using or ideally you're using curtailed energy so this is energy that would otherwise be wasted um, or, or spilt and so uh, any efficiency is better than zero which would what what the efficiency would be if you were curtailing that energy and what you see around the world in in places like Germany and Scandinavia and the UK is that once you get to 20 plus percent of um, capacities um, for planted up renewables you start to see this curtailment um, event happen more and more frequently and that's just essentially wasted energy uh, there's nothing you can do you can't get the energy back it's gone um, and so what you can do is you can store that energy you can store it in a battery you can pump water up a hill flywheels all these different types of energy storage and they all have their niche markets where they play a good role and I think where a hydrogen can fit well into that mix is long-term, large volumes of energy storage um, and energy to fuel to, to fuel vehicles. You know, is a real sweet spot where hydrogen uh, wins out over a lot of the other um, potential technologies that you can use. And I think the reality is that in the future, you'll see a mix of these technologies being used to get the overall efficiency of the um, of the whole power sector as high as possible. Yeah, one of the things I hear discussed a lot, and I, and I think it's kind of a false analysis, is that you know once these uh, big grids uh, get to kind of saturation of renewables, that suddenly we won't have any curtailed power because we're we're going to be at that point where now we've we've kind of balanced it really well. But in my estimation, we're we're always going to be looking for a larger and larger demand on energy and we'll always kind of be outstepping um, the, the requirements and always have curtailed power from renewable sources, intermittent renewable sources. So is that the kind of long-term take from ITM too, that, that all the curtailed power may, may lessen a little bit down the road, it'll always be a factor? And do you, do you have enough confidence in the overall technology that, that the, uh, the electrolyzer will actually become an efficient way to make clean hydrogen? Uh, even if the electricity is, you know, not always curtailed, but a little bit more expensive. Yeah, sure, I really do. And I think that if you look at, um, you know, these analogies of things like to make the whole amount of energy from the world, you only need a small amount of solar power, but you need to store it. It comes at the wrong time. And I think if you look at areas of the world that have a lot of renewables, certainly more than, than California or even Hawaii, you get to see the kind of... Um, uh, grid imbalance effects that happen um, and because public awareness and um, public behavior is a very difficult thing to change you will always get these huge peaks of demand in energy when everybody's going home gets home from work plugs everything in starts to do things uh, it kind of it, it always overlaps as to when the sun's going in. and so you get this huge mismatch of demand and supply and you're, you're not going to change that, even if you have vast, vast amounts of renewable energy that's planted up. You're just going to get more amount, more volume of energy that is curtailed, um, even if the percentages of curtailed energy um, reduce, the physical volume, the terawatt hours of energy are only going to go up. And so that represents a huge opportunity for companies like ITM and other energy storage companies to try and grab that energy, uh, store it, and then use it for sensible things later down the line um, to, to boost the overall efficiency of the energy system. And I think that thinking about energy as just electricity or just gas or just petroleum, um, you know, it is a very archaic view of, of energy. And I think going forward, if we to meet all of these goals that, you know, Hawaii, California, other areas of the world have set themselves very aggressive renewable energy goals, we're going to need to think a little bit broader if we're going to meet that. I agree. And uh, I think we'll, we're going to get, take a quick break here. When we come back, though, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about like the, the loss or the, 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 the energy used for compression on the transportation side and some things like that that uh, maybe we can attack to help drive. I know you mentioned, you mentioned that using the, the reject heat from your electrolyzers and, and capturing that energy source makes your systems more efficient. So maybe we can chat a little bit more about that after our break here. Happy to. Thanks.
Aloha! We invite you to join us on our Keys to Success show, which is live on the Think Tech live streaming network series weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. My name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. And I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. Our goal for Keys to Success is to provide a platform for professional and personal development tools and profound insights on how to achieve success in life, career and or business. We have incredible guests from all walks of life, including politicians, successful business owners, leaders, entrepreneurs and authors. As this is a live show, there are live mess ups as well, which are fun to watch. Aloha and we'll see you on Thursday. Welcome back to Stan Energy Man. Thanks for spending your lunch hour with me. We've got uh, Steve Jones from ITM out of uh, Anaheim, California, talking to us today on Skype. And uh, I'm really excited. Uh, just a little background. I, I met Steve probably three years ago in Los Angeles at a fuel cell conference. And um, just talking to him a little bit about what ITM's doing in Europe when it first started out uh, kind of got me excited. And I shared some of the information um, that his company puts out publicly with some of the PUC members here and some of the folks in our state energy office. And, uh, and I think it finally got some traction after a, a fairly short time. Um, so we're going we're gonna to kind of move our conversation towards uh, more efficient electrolyzers first and then a little bit into the model that uh, Europe's using to, to not only produce hydrogen for the transportation sector, but to also move it around the continental uh, the mass of Europe to, uh, to make it available uh, for the transportation public. And I, I point out to people that one of the really important things here is that, you know, with, with gasoline right now, you throw that in a, in a tanker truck and drive it around, and that costs money too. And a pipeline is a much more efficient way to move energy around uh, long distances than, uh, than in, a pipe, than in uh, tube trailers or tractor-driven trailers or even trains for that matter. And that's what Europe's taking advantage of now. So, so Steve, let's first talk about a little bit about maybe wh where you see electrolyzers going and some of the things we can do to improve the round trip efficiency on uh, producing hydrogen cleanly with an electrolyzer and then move into the European model. Sure, yeah. So um, the electrolyzers, as I said at the moment, about 75% efficiency um, and that's power into hydrogen out. And some of the things that we're doing as a company moving forward is, is incremental efficiencies to the individual chemistries that happen inside the electrolyzer and that's done through our R&D center in the UK and they're constantly reformulating things and, and making incremental steps in, in efficiency. Um, I think one of the other things is looking at um, ways to utilize some of the waste products from an electrolyzer, namely heat, um, and how that can um, boost the overall efficiency uh, of the system. As I mentioned, we have a, a plant running in Germany, which is at 86% efficiency because it uses the heat. Obviously, that, that's quite um, site-specific. Um, but I think you'll see a gradual uh, increase in efficiency from, ele from electrolysis products from 75 up to you know the 85 percent range within the next few years. So, what kind of pressure comes off of your stack right off the stack? Um. So, our, our stacks are relatively high high pressure for the industry. So, we have systems that operate at uh, 20 bar, 50 bar, and up to 80 bar pressure, and that's straight from the electrolyzer, and it enables you to save some um, downstream compression energy. Um, later on, if you if you're ultimately compressing it up to high pressure for vehicles, for example, and yeah, we have a, a project we're getting ready to take on with some folks from Arizona, where we're looking at getting in excess of 700 bar pressure off of a. It's not actually a stack, but it is an electrolyzer, and um, we're excited about the potential for that because that could be a, a huge game changer um, if companies like yours could could capture that efficiency as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, you're looking at. Uh, generally speaking, if the larger the compressor, the less efficiency penalty it has on the overall system. But it's still definitely a slice of, of the pie when you're looking at overall energy efficiency of a system. Um, and if you can, if you can eliminate that, um, it's always more efficient to uh, compress the hydrogen internal to the electrolyzer than it is via a, an external mechanical device. Outstanding. Well, let's transition now to what you, your company's doing over in Europe um, that actually, like, like you say, uh, the, the idea of energy is no longer just electricity or gasoline and diesel. It's kind of a, now one big uh, market where 
uh, all the renewables and all the electrical power and what we're using to drive uh, our vehicles is starting to all merge into one huge system. And we all agree that um, electrification of the transportation sector is not a matter of if, but when, um, and what kind of storage you're going to have on the vehicle for energy, whether it's just batteries, maybe graphene batteries will be a breakthrough in a few years, but hydrogen certainly will play a role and is destined to play a role in most people's minds right now. So what are the kind of things that ITM is doing in Europe to make hydrogen possible for the transportation sector? Yeah, so um, I think two, two main areas. Um, in, uh, in Germany um, and in the UK and in Scandinavia, we're looking at the concept of power to gas, so using the gas grid network to move hydrogen around for various energy-hungry um, processes. Now, whether that be you know, heating your home or firing a boiler or using as a transportation fuel, you know, kind of all of the above um, is, is the real answer once you've injected it into the pipeline. But looking at more direct um, projects that we're involved in, in the UK, for example, um, we have uh, 17, no, 16, sorry, hydrogen refueling stations um, that will be going into the UK, all of which uh, utilize electrolysis technology to use the electricity grid network, renewable power network to provide a transportation fuel for the growing number of uh, fuel cell vehicles in the UK. Um, and the UK energy uh, market is looking at how can we best use these electrolyzers as effectively dump loads to mop up renewable electricity when there is an excess on the grid. And so they're looking at ways and means to devise um, specialized tariff structures to uh, financially incentivize um, people like uh, ITM with electrolysis technology that is able to receive um, large amounts of energy, you know, at the flick of a switch. Um, so does ITM actually have their own proprietary control systems that work in a grid that help you do that mop up, as you say, of, you know, when you have stray right. voltage running around here and there, you can pull it all in and use it? Yeah, so our, our electrolyzers um, are, are very rapid response. You know, you can turn them on and off sub-second. And so that helps um, when you're managing the grid, when you're doing things like frequency response, demand-side management, where you have to be able to react very quickly in order to balance the grid. And now the, 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 uh, the grid operators are becoming more knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about hydrogen and, and the, the um, opportunities that electroly electrolysis allows them. And so we're working with those guys to um, develop the control systems required so that when the grid need to spill energy, you know, they can do it instantly. They can tell us to turn on, we turn on, we, we absorb the load um, for as long as they want us to absorb the load and they can turn us off just as quickly. Oh, okay. And how about on the, on the continent over in uh, Germany and um, maybe Germany, France, Netherlands, you know, how are your systems or other systems from companies like yours working out over there and that power to gas concept, how's that working out on the continent there? Yeah, it's going well. I think Germany has the most um, deployments uh, of projects. Um, you know, there are, there are over a dozen projects now in Germany where electrolyzers are being used um, for power to gas energy storage um, for various sizes of systems. And there's been um, uh, a few reports done by the European Union that look at how best to use power to gas within the energy mix, you know, with batteries and flywheels and pumped hydro and all of the rest of it. Um, and most of those, if not all of those studies that have looked at it, have all concluded that for what they call deep decarbonization of, of, the, um, of the energy sector, hydrogen is going to play a role, and it's going to play a role at the large, large amounts of energy storage and long durations of energy storage is really where hydrogen plays out. Um, and when you're looking at an alternative energy source for a sector that's as large as the transportation sector, then really you need to be absorbing terawatt hours of energy long term to be able to meet those energy demands. So hydrogen has a real um, benefit for the transportation sector. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's echoed by all of the different car companies that are bringing hydrogen vehicles to market. You know, you sit, uh, as you and I sit quite often in conferences and things like that, where the executives of these companies 
are getting up and talking about the future of mobility, all of them see A, electrification as the way forward, but B, hydrogen as the long-term propulsion technology that's going to drive us forward and, and meet the goals that everybody's setting these days. Well, that's, that's great. Uh, I agree 100%. And it's nice to hear from outside of our territorial boundaries here in the island state of Hawaii that uh, other places are coming to that realization that um, it's great, uh, a great tool to help you control your grid and store energy from your grid, especially when you have excess power off renewables, intermittent renewables in particular, and the benefit to the transportation sector. Because here in Hawaii, uh, you know, we're, we've got great strides, um, you know, going towards uh, getting our grid off of fossil fuels, which we're almost totally dependent on between coal and oil uh, to make our electricity. We have a, quite a bit of a penetration of uh, solar uh, and more in the queue waiting to be given interconnect agreements. A lot of the folks are really excited about getting connected, but um, they've got rate structure changes happening, which is something we haven't had uh, here previously, there's some dockets in the Public Utility Commission that will do the things like you mentioned in Europe where you structure the rates, the rates for uh, renewables and, and electricity so that it incentivizes use of it, uh, use of the, the curtailed power or the time of day use uh, to mm -hmm. be much more functional and, and get you other benefits. So we're hoping that the transportation sector in Hawaii, which is about 60% of our fossil fuel use, is gonna see a benefit uh, from the kind of things that we're seeing in Europe and the technologies we're seeing by your company that are uh, being employed in Europe to get hydrogen more out in the transportation sector and help us with our electrification of the transportation grid. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's, um, that's really important. And I think that Hawaii as, as a territory, and I've, you know, I've been out there quite a few times and I've met with the, with the uh, PUC there and the, and the local gas company um, and there's a lot of similarities that can be drawn between island communities like Hawaii and areas of northern Europe. You know, the UK is an island. Um, in Europe, gas prices are a lot higher than they are in, in, on the mainland in the US, for example, uh, like they are in Hawaii. Um, so when you're faced with an energy system where you can't rely on essentially an infinite pipeline of really cheap natural gas, um, you need to do something a little different and um, you know the UK and Hawaii um, have got quite a few similarities in that regard because although the UK is interconnected with mainland Europe um, it's by no means uh, connected enough to be able to solve all of our problems uh, and a lot of our energy is still imported just like it is in Hawaii so I think there are a lot of similarities that can benefit both uh, both territories that's a great that's a really great point Steve and you know, believe it or not, we're, we're up against our uh, stop time here, and I'd like to thank you for your participation on Think Tech Hawaii and Stan Energy Man show. Um, I definitely am going to have you back on in the not too distant future, so we can dig a little bit deeper in. But can you can you help us with one piece of information over in Europe? What does it cost for a liter of gasoline or a gallon of gasoline? Just so we have some sense of comparison here in Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. So a liter of um, unleaded fuel in the UK, for example, is a little over one pound sterling. So that's about, uh, say, one dollar fifty. Um, and if you think there are four liters in a gallon, so that's four. That's five dollars uh, per gallon. And it's gone much higher than that. You know, it's relatively low at the moment. I can remember it being one pound fifty per liter. Um, so you know. It's, it's really, uh, it's, you know, it's less than a third of the cost in the U.S. All right, great incentive for us to, to really think about this stuff seriously because we've seen our gas prices go pretty high. So, Steve, thanks again for being on the show with us, and uh, we no appreciate problem. you calling in from California. Hope your surfing's going well, and, uh, and you get back to wearing a dry suit in, in U.K. if you get back to U.K. to do some surfing there. And uh, we'll get you back on the show here to talk some more about hydrogen. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Enjoyed it. Thank All right. You. Hello, and thanks to everyone for joining me on my lunch hour. Stan, the engineer man, signing off till next week, and we'll see you then. Aloha.